opening statement set to begin this morning in former President Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial. After jury selection wrapped up on Friday, the 12 person jury is made up of seven men and five women, along with six alternates. Later this morning, both the prosecution and the defense are expected to lay out their cases during opening statements. According to the New York Times, the prosecution plans to frame Trump's actions of payments to keep adult film actress Stormy Daniels quiet about an alleged affair as election interference. The defense, meanwhile, will seize on three apparent weak points, witness credibility, the president's culpability, and the case's legal complexity. One of the potential first witnesses expected to testify is David Pecker, the former CEO of America Media Incorporated, who bought and buried damaging stories about Trump. It's called Catch and Kill. His, he is alleged to have worked with Trump and his former attorney, Michael Cohen, to bury the Stormy Daniels story. Other witnesses expected to testify include Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, former Trump aide Hope Hicks, and former Playboy model Karen McDougal, who also alleged a sexual relationship with Trump. And as former President Trump left court on Friday, he continued to insist that he plans to testify in his own defense. Oh, joining us now, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and also MSNBC legal analyst Danny Savalo. Sorry about that. We thought uh, we were going to hear Trump, but obviously we've heard what we had to say a thousand times. Um, so, Lisa, what do we expect today? Uh, we know that one of the first witnesses is David Pecker, but do you expect that opening statements get finished today? Or just technically, what are we looking for in terms of getting accomplished today in court? Mika, a lot of the judicial housekeeping that you would expect to be taken care of before the trial really starts has all been brushed off Judge Mershon's plate. He's decided all of the pretrial motions. We have a jury, as you noted, that's been sat. So I expect that very soon after 930 this morning, we will get to opening statements. And while neither of the parties has outlined exactly how long they will take, as Danny knows better than anyone, an opening statement is your opportunity to preview your case for the jury. And while you want to do that in a way that gives them an overview, you also don't want to exhaust them. I expect that neither side will take more than roughly 60 to 70 minutes. And that means that we will have time to get to the first witness who, as you noted, is expected to be former chairman of American Media and the National Enquirer, David Pecker. Lisa, where are we on jurors these days? Because two had to leave and there were only six spares to begin with. So does that mean we're down to four potential spares or no, there's still how many do we have left and are they sequestered? Can you just talk a little bit about how they are being managed, so to speak, during this process as all this intense scrutiny and there's so much press surrounding it? Right. So the two jurors that we lost were replaced that same day, leading to a total of 12 jurors who have been seated. In addition to that, we do have six alternates. The jurors, however, are not sequestered, Elise. Mm -hmm. There have been accommodations made to ensure their anonymity. However, we don't know, for example, what provisions are being taken to get them to the courthouse for their departure from the courthouse, what the lunch provisions are. In federal court, in the E. Jean Carroll trials, both of those juries were not only anonymous, but steps were taken to ensure that, for example, they didn't come directly from their home to the courthouse. They met the U.S. Marshals at an off-site location and then were brought to the courthouse underground so that nobody would see their comings and goings. I'm hopeful that Judge Mershon is able to make some similar provisions for the jurors in this case so that they can remain protected throughout the, the duration of the trial. So here's the thing. I think juror attrition could be a real problem in this case. I mean, just do the math. Last week, we lost two jurors jurors before the trial even began. When you think about it, you do lose jurors during a trial. I've lost them. They fell asleep. They don't follow the judge's orders. But you don't normally lose a juror after the moment they're selected and between that and the time that the trial actually begins because ordinarily nothing happens during that time. But in this case, you have an example where a juror goes home. They start really thinking about their duty and what this is going to entail. And they come back and say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. 
By the way, that's also something that happens from time to time. I've had it in organized crime cases. You have jurors who come up to the judge and say, I'll do anything, please. I do not want to be on this jury. I'm afraid. That's not obviously the same situation here, but you do have jurors who are going to have second thoughts. And the question becomes, will six alternates be enough to cover this trial? I hope so. But if what we've seen so far, if that's the rate of loss of jurors, two or before we even start the trial, that could be a real problem. And that could lead to a mistrial, which in I think the defense's view is a win, even though it doesn't mean you start the trial again in a year or something like that. Mistrials, normally uh, the court schedules the retrial as soon as they possibly can. But uh, yeah, juror attrition is going to be a real issue in this case. And again, I couldn't agree more with Lisa. Opening statements are not going to be all day. Look for an hour from the prosecution and probably less from the defense, because all they're doing today is offering a preview. They're, you're going to hear this probably many times. The evidence will show that dot, dot, dot. The evidence will show that dot, dot, dot. It's really just a promise to the jurors of what the facts will show. And if you're the defense, you do not want to be making a lot of promises. For example, you will not hear the words, <laughs> you're gonna hear from the defendant himself, <laughs> because if you make that promise, nobody's going to forget it. So they will say, my, I expect the prosecution will try to focus on something they've already seated the jury on, which is, you're going to hear from some people who are not that credible, but they're not credible because they're Donald Trump's friends. On the defense side, you'll probably hear some version of try to keep an open mind. Uh, the evidence is not all in. We don't have the burden and just sort of the standard fare. But you're not going to see anything as flashy, anything as dramatic, as exciting as we're going to see during closing arguments. This is only going to be a preview and it will not take the entire day at all. <laughs> You know, um, as, as Danny said, in mob cases, there are jurors that will tell the judge that they're afraid for their safety and they, they want to get off. He said this isn't exactly like that, but really it, it, it is in many cases and that a lot of jurors are fearful mm -hmm. of, of, of repercussions if they're in uh, on a jury that's impaneled uh, that, that, that rules against uh, Donald Trump. I mean, because they want the names out the judge trying to keep the names from getting out there but this is over time this has proven to be very well, very dangerous and tough in this trial everybody is under duress uh you know donald trump's past statements before the gag or even with the gag order about the judge about yeah. the judge's daughter about with the jury everybody is under a a, a great deal of stress and yeah. concern about their safety and i would add um that it's Donald Trump, no matter which way this goes, that you got to keep your eye on because Donald Trump right now is enduring something that he's never had to endure in his entire life, where he has to be somewhere every day and do what he's told. When he's told to sit down by the judge, he has to sit down. That happened on Friday at least once. When he tries to get on his phone, he's told to get off of his phone. Um, he has to be there watching his former friends, David Pecker, Hope Hicks, and two alleged former lovers testifying for or against him. This is not what he's used to. Uh, this, is a, this is a guy, as we look at pictures of Donald Trump here, um, this is a guy, John Meacham, that has spent his entire life uh, creating this, this warped reality. Uh, that 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 goes wherever his mind wants it to go and keeping people around him that allows him to avoid reality, keeping people around him that does exactly what he wants to do. He was so proud of having a button on, uh, on uh, his White House desk. He goes, I press this button and somebody brings in Diet Coke. He loved the complete control and, and command and he has his entire life. And now he's sitting down six, seven, eight hours a day, and... Um, At 78 years old. 78 years old, judge telling him what to do, falling asleep, being mocked, uh, getting angry about that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, quite a territory. situation and new territory for Donald Trump. And arguably, no American in history has so warped everyone else's reality as well, right? I mean, it, it, it's not simply his imaginative universe. He's imposed 
his imaginative universe, his grievances, uh, his vision of uh, enemies versus himself on everyone. And we're living uh, in this, this warped reality. And so one thing about uh, the last couple of weeks and about these images that I think, maybe this isn't a particularly popular uh, thing to say, but this is actually a somewhat reassuring set of images because it suggests mm -hmm. that there is something more important than one single man and the will of one single man. And that is the rule of law. And he is submitting himself uh, to uh, the legal processes of the country. And it should remind people, uh, not of somehow or another his victimhood, but of that great Thomas Paine insight that we don't have a king. In America, the law is king. And what we're seeing in the New York courtroom, however, tawdry the uh, narrative around right. it is, the, the facts of the case, that doesn't matter. What matters is that the law itself is supreme. It's not yeah. just about the appetites and ambitions of one person. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.